ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Sarah Boddy. Hi, everyone. Uh, Lori actually writes for F5 Labs. She's awesome. Give her a round of applause. I thought she was great. So I've been in the security industry for 20 years, and I've learned a lot. Um, I have the pleasure of running F5 Labs, where pretty much everybody on my team has just as much experience in the security industry as I do. Um, we are a team of CISOs, security product developers, security engineers, and technical writers. And we sit behind our desks all day, every day, and even at nights and weekends, and we're analyzing threats. We write content that we publish to F5 Labs. It is all designed to help you guys prioritize your security programs. Like I said, it's written by people who are security ops professionals. Um, we do p two pieces of content a week, so I'm gonna share with you guys some of the latest threat research coming out of labs that I think would be really helpful to you. And then I'm gonna help you guys out with some tips and tricks that worked well for me when I ran security at Demand Media. Um, so here we go. So I'm gonna level set with you guys in the opening some basic truths of the internet now. So apps are the reason people use the internet. A lot of internet consumers actually think that the internet is Facebook, or they think it's Twitter, or they think it's their mobile banking app, right? Applications are how your customers interface with your business. To your customers, apps are your business. They are also the gateway to data. Attackers know this, so applications are the target. Um, I'm not just saying applications are the target because I work for F5. Um, it happens to conveniently fit into our business model right now that that's where our attackers are going, and I'm going to prove that to you in global attack data and breach trends. So now that I've kind of narrowed the scope to application security, I'm going to blow that right back up for you guys. So the average enterprise has 765 apps in play. That's a lot of apps. That's an overwhelming amount of apps if you're going to try to secure them, right? One third of them are mission critical. When you put an app online, it's not more than six minutes before it gets probed by an attacker. And if you're vulnerable, you'll be owned in less than two hours. This has actually happened to me. Our corporate website at Demand Media was running WordPress. We use it for our CMS. WordPress released a critical remote code execution vulnerability that we couldn't auto apply a patch to because we had customized the CMS too much. Don't do that, that's a tip. Um, and we were owned in less than two hours. So our corporate website was now redirecting people that were supposed to be learning about our business to a shady car loan site. I think it was out of Romania somewhere. <laughs> All right, so a year ago, we started at Labs working on what is now called the Application Protection Report. It's available on Labs for you guys. Um, in the process of doing that, we had to come up with a new model for how to look at application security because there wasn't really a good way to look at application security holistically. And if we're trying to focus on application security because applications are the targets, well, what do we mean by that? What are the layers of an app? What do we need to protect? What are all the threats to the app, right? And we came up with this model. Um, it's quite overwhelming. Um, this is literally as simple as we could get it, but I'm going to walk you through it. So we call them app tiers, because we don't want to confuse you with OSI layers. So I'm talking about tiers of an app. The top tier is the application services tier. So this is your code. This is your operating system. This is third-party services that you have layered onto your app. This is really the core of your app. The next tier down is the access tier. If you don't have access to your app, there's literally no point in having it, right? Um, in the middle here is the encryption tier. Hopefully everybody is using TLS. SSL is out. No more SSL, please. Um, the fourth tier down there is DNS, the address book of the internet. If you don't have DNS configured with your app, nobody's going to get to it, right? It's kind of like mailing a letter to a non-address. Um, and then just for the purposes of this model, we've got network at the bottom, but in reality, the network is you know, infused between everything, connecting everything together, and connecting your app to back-end systems, storage, monitoring tools, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot going on here, right? This is, this is overwhelming. This is where threat intelligence comes into play. Um, we analyze global attack data. We analyze breaches to figure out what the root cause is. And we do this so we can simplify and prioritize our efforts to where you are most likely to get attacked and where you are most likely to get breached from that attack. So F5 Labs has done two different research projects to analyze this data set in particular and figure out where you are most likely to get attacked. In one research project, we looked at 10 years of breaches across the entire globe. And in another research project, we looked at one year of breaches just in the US. And you're going to get varying numbers depending on the scope that you look at. But what is always true is that breaches most often start with an application attack followed by an identity attack. So that's where we want you guys to prioritize application security. So again, no matter if you look at 10 years or double click on one year, look at the US or look at the entire globe, 
Breaches from the majority standpoint start with application or identity attacks. So if you want to click in on, double click on, on the types of application attacks that lead to breaches the most, um, it is obviously injection. I think most security professionals in the room would nod their heads and say, yeah, that makes sense, right? Um, specifically targeting PHP and MySQL. So if you're going to go back to work on Monday and remediate some vulnerabilities, start there if you've got any of that going on. Um, we are not the only ones that says this. OWASP top 10 list injection vulnerabilities have been the number one. Last two times they've published the list. They just refreshed it last year. So then access attacks, that second bucket. Um, compromised email is the biggest piece of the pie. To me, that means an employee getting fished, and that either being your corporate email or their personal email. Most, a lot of employees use those same username and password combos between personal and business all the time. Right here on this slide, I have grouped together compromised email, credential stuffing, and social engineering together in one bucket, because to me, that means you cannot trust your users. Your users are gonna get fished. They're gonna give up their credentials. You have to have multi-factor authentication in place. You just can't deal with access attacks anymore without multi-factor authentication. So speaking of not being able to trust your users, you can't trust your clients either. Your clients fall victim to the exact same phishing attacks your employees do. Their systems, their mobile phones, their laptops, their desktops, they're getting infected with malware. They're logging into your applications and attackers are stealing your money. Banks have had to deal with this problem for a really long time, and they've gotten really good at identifying fraud within their clients, because they use products like WebSafe, or they do their own custom you know, scripting inside of their apps. Um, this, they've been so effective at identifying fraud, banks specifically, that attackers have completely had to shift their targets. We publish malware pieces on F5 Labs all the time where we literally show you the targets of a particular banking trojan. And for the last year, at least 50% of the targets have not been financial institutions. They've been like CRMs and car loan sites. And basically any, pay, any app with a login is going to get targeted with fraud now. So much so that we don't even call them banking trojans anymore. We just call them fraud trojans. So we talked about attacks, how they're happening, who's actually attacking you. Um, I think there's a lot more bad guys out there than good guys. Um, attackers know that there's a deficit of security people around the world, so if any of you guys want to get into security, we need you. Um, we at Labs, I think most of the security community are completely sick of seeing hackers in hoodies, so we redrew some new attackers for you. Um, there's a helpful model here to, to look at attackers. It's called CHU, and it's by motive. So criminals, hacktivists, espionage, warfare. So I'm going to walk you through this. Um, the run-of-the-mill criminal is what you guys are probably most familiar with. This is the guy in, in the top right. These guys are doing anything to make money. They're attacking your applications. They're mining cryptocurrency on them. You know, they're sending um, spyware and ransomware into your systems. Um, people are paying the ransom, so this is not going to stop. Um, they're stealing your PII, and they're selling it on the black market. What's really interesting here, and we did this analysis in a, in a breach report on labs, um, there's been so much stolen data. I think you guys know this because you see breach you know, headlines pretty much every day. There's been so much stolen data that PII is not really worth that much anymore on the black market. Um, I looked at a case a couple months ago where credit card data was selling for 0 .0003 cents a record. That's not a lot of money for the attacker, right? They go through all this effort to compromise your app, steal your data, and then they don't get much money for it. That's why they're mining cryptocurrency on your, on your applications now, because the CPUs are worth a lot more than PII. Um, so bottom right is your typical hacktivist. Um, so this is everything from your script kitty to you know, more sophisticated cyber groups like Anonymous. Um, these guys are writing malware and botnets just for kind of notoriety within the hacker community, but they also do a lot of protest style attacks. Uh, where in Boston, Boston's Children's Hospital was deed off offline by a guy that claimed he was part of Anonymous. He just got prosecuted last week. This happens all the time. Um, we don't want to be sexist. There are attackers out there that are female, so our espionage chick in the top left. Um, <laughs> yay, we got a female attacker. It's not a good thing. Don't do it. Um, we just had to have at least one woman in there. So a lot of espionage is actually nation states. Um, they're doing um, cyber attacks for the purposes of stealing your, um, your intellectual property. The U.S. specifically loses $600 billion a year in intellectual property theft. This is, you know, sponsored nation state activities, stealing intellectual property, and then building something cheaper and faster in another country. This is actually, you know, literally have shifted global economic wealth through intellectual property theft. 
Um, and then last but not least is warfare. Um, bottom left, this is probably the most obvious one, right? Um, a lot of nation states are stealing data or spying on people and using espionage tactics, but you can also use cyber attacks um, for a physical advantage in warfare. For instance, you can DDoS an entire country offline and then they can't communicate if you wanted to roll in on tanks and do something from a physical standpoint. Um, you can attack a power station and take an entire city's power out. Both of those things have happened. So what are they attacking with? Um, we do a lot of research in the Internet of Things. Attackers are now using things. Things are cyber weapons now. Our smart homes, our smart buildings, our smart cities are what attackers use to launch their attacks. Um, what I'm showing you here is a timeline of what we call thing bots, so bots made out of IoT. I'm showing you a timeline of their discovery, not their development, their discovery over the last 10 years. Um, this is relatively a new phenomenon in the attacker community just because it's been like the hottest thing for them to do in terms of attacking in the last two years, but in reality it's been going on for about 10 years. Um, it's just like any threat, it happens slowly behind the scenes and then suddenly it's a big deal. What's really important here though is there are nine billion things deployed across the world right now, and analysts expect there to be 30 billion by 2020. So in the next year and a half, there's supposed to be 30 billion IoT devices out there. They're way too easy to compromise. It is way too easy for attackers to create these thing bots. In most cases, they're launching DDoS attacks. Have you guys heard of Mirai? It's probably the most infamous thing bot. Um, it's actually the red robot. You can't really see him very well, but he's got the heart of a DVR and the head of an IP camera, and he's got some wireless routers on him. So Mirai launched a 1.2 terabit per second attack against DynDNS two years ago and took out a third of the internet at that time. There is another thing bot that we know about called Reaper. 1.2 terabit per second DLS attack, that's huge, right? There's a thing bot we know about called Reaper that can launch, theoretically, a 12 terabit per second attack. We're talking about like an internet lights out attack. Reaper hasn't attacked yet, we just know it's out there. Um, there's a thing bot that was discovered this year named GenX. GenX offers 300 gigabit per second attacks for 20 bucks. I read an article last night that says the average allowance a, a US parent gives their child per week is 17 bucks. So the amount of money we pay our kids in an allowance can knock pretty much every business in here offline outside of service providers and some of you big banks out there that I know can handle attacks that big, right? So, but DDoS attacks are not the only thing that ThingBots are doing. In the last um, three to six months, we've seen a big shift in multi-purpose attack bots for hire. So not only are they offering DDoS tools, but they're offering launching a proxy servers, Tor nodes, they're doing crypto mining, they're doing broad collection credential, cl excuse me, credential collection at scale, they're doing um, credential stuffing, they're doing all sorts of different stuff. These are literally like multi-purpose attack bots for hire. Remember I told you there's nine billion things out there right now that are theoretically getting infected. I'm not saying that all nine billion are, but a lot of them are insecure and they're easy to infect. When we're dealing with attacks from thing bots, it's really important in the future that when you guys have controls in place like any DDoS, it has to be able to scale. It has to have proactive bot defense or it's never gonna be able to scale this threat. When you guys are trying to protect your applications that are getting attacked from thing bots, you have to have proactive bot defense. There's just simply too many things out there that are too easy to get compromised. This, this attack vector is, is massive now. So moving on into more issues with things. This part I'm very personally passionate about. Um, we did a talk, not we, Justin Shuttuck on my team did a talk at Black Hat last week where we literally showed on stage, um, Justin followed a police car around a city. He literally showed the map of following a police car around a city at Black Hat. And everything he did to make that map, everything he did to do that project at Black Hat was not illegal. Emergency fleets have cellular IoT devices inside of them that give away GPS coordinates for free. You do not have to authenticate to the device. You can follow a cop car around, you can follow an ambulance fleet, you can follow fire trucks. These same types of cellular IoT devices exist in pretty much every fleet out there that has some sort of critical service that needs to be always on with long range connectivity. If you want it to be really bad and authenticate to that device illegally, it's very simple to do so. The user, the admin user is user, the password is numerical, it's five digits, it starts at one, ends at five. So it is very easy for bad guys to use these devices in a very you know, malicious type of way. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities there from warfare to terrorism, like the list goes on and on, right? And these devices are actually exploited now. They're used in Mirai, they're used in Reaper, those thing bots that I talked about before. 
Um, we do a lot of research on IoT in general. We publish reports of Trump traveling around the world and how attacks spike against IoT devices in whatever city he's in. So you can attack you know, wireless cameras sitting on the side of a building, or you could try to attack a VoIP system that might be inside of the hotel room that they're talking about. Um, attackers know that these things are out there, they're vulnerable, and they're using it to their advantage. The CIA came out a couple months ago and said, we're having a problem with Internet of Things making our agents get made through IP cameras and satellite cameras and wearables, right? If you guys are driving a car with power windows, it is most likely able to get remotely exploited from anywhere in the world, and car assassinations are actually a thing. It has happened multiple times. Um, there was a report that came out in the last month where they interviewed industrial control system owners inside of the US, and 60% of them said that their industrial control systems had been compromised in this last year. There was a talk at Black Hat, I'm talking last week, where somebody was opening up the floodgates to a dam. We know that industrial control systems are compromised. This is not new. I'm still a little bitter they got more press than our, than our police car story. But this stuff is really, really important. And I'm gonna quote Justin Shadok here at Black Hat last week. He said that we are becoming the things of the internet. And I, I really believe that he's right. Security has literally never been more important. So, woo saw moment. Um, this is not meant to scare anybody. Information is powerful. We make decisions and we change bad behaviors when we know what we're doing wrong. So keep that in mind. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through some tips and tricks um, to deal with some of the things that I'm talking about today. So I mentioned the application protection report that we had been working on that delivered us that app stack model. Um, in that report, we interviewed 3,000 security professionals around the world and we asked them, what is your number one challenge to application security? And they said, visibility. We asked CISOs, what is your mission? And they all said, prevent downtime. If you don't know what those 765 apps are in your environment, or maybe the 230 that are supposedly mission critical, if you don't know what those are, you can't prevent downtime. You can't prevent an attack, which is gonna cause downtime, right? So two things I did at Demand Media that I am um, kind of scrappy and practical and really worked out really well for us to discover what apps we had in play. One was we had web filtering software in place. We had to have web filtering because employees would get fished and we wanted to block that access to a fish, phishing site. We also had web filtering because we needed to block employees from going to adult sites. Um, it's never who you think it is. Um, we also used NTOP. NTOP is a free network monitoring tool. We had to use it because it demand our corporate headquarters. We couldn't get a big enough pipe to satisfy all of the employee internet surfing. So we had to monitor our traffic, and if there was a bandwidth hog, we'd have to go run over and say, hey, stop that AWS job, you're, you're killing our internet circuit. So anyways, we used those two tools to figure out what apps employees were using. It was actually more effective than going through the legal department and accounting to figure out what apps were sanctioned, because we also needed to know what apps employees were using that were not corporate sanctioned. The Yahoo breach happened when I was at Demand. We knew a lot of employees used Yahoo for their personal email. So when that breach happened, we went and made, enforced the password reset across the entire company. So it's really important that you not only figure out what apps are going on in your environment, but the ones that are not corporate sanctioned that your employees are using, because you don't want somebody else's breach to be a credential stuffing attack on your organization, right? So moving on, reduce your attack surface. Um, people put everything on the internet open to the entire big bad internet because it's easier, right? It's easier to remotely access it. It's, easier when somebody complains, I can't get to the app, you don't have to go look at a firewall rule and be like, oh, we blocked a certain area, right? Um, it's really important that you reduce your attack surface and not everything has to touch the internet. If it does, a lot of times it can be restricted to a smaller set of IPs that can access it, right? If you go through this exercise, it is really important that you validate it on a regular basis. So again, when I was at Demand, we used to run um, perimeter security scans once a month and at least twice a year, we would find like a network management port accidentally opened because maybe a network engineer um, or a systems engineer had to open up remote access because they had to go to a training class or maybe they had to go deploy a new data center somewhere around the world. This kind of stuff happens. You have to check often to, to make sure that things don't accidentally get opened or if they do get opened on purpose, they actually get closed when the job is done. Um, for those of you out there that are like, yeah, duh, this is, I've already, I already know this, we already do this. Um, we're doing something really cool with automated deception defense, and Hitesh, who you guys just heard from, and Raymond Pom Pom on my team work together to automate code where you guys can automatically spin up apps, cloned apps of your environment, and then um, sinkhole your attackers somewhere, and then you can do all sorts of fun stuff to mess with them. 
Um, so if you guys want to do something more cool, that, that, that class is tomorrow afternoon. So for the apps that have to touch the big bad internet, absolutely have to prioritize them for vulnerability management. So we are working on a new page on f5labs.com that is going to be a repository of application vulnerabilities. In the process of creating this site, we scraped every known vulnerability database and app out there so we could get a full collection of vulnerabilities, right? In that process, we figured out that there is a critical vulnerability released every single nine hours. Every nine hours. That's crazy. That's like two and a half, more than two and a half times a day, right? The NSA told us at RSA this year that they have not been hit with a zero day in over two years. The reason for that is there's attackers are weaponizing vulnerabilities in less than 24 hours, and that is faster than organizations can patch. I can see you guys. Raise your hand if you think you can patch in less than 24 hours. All of production completely patched if a critical vulnerability came out that impacted your environment. Nobody? I, if anybody can, come talk to me afterwards because I want to know how you're doing it. Let's, let's talk about it. Automation with F5, yes. But getting all the approvals through business owners, like it's a hard process, right? I agree with that. Okay, but think about this. Most vulnerabilities get released in US time. What if you're on the other side of the world and by the time you know about it, half a day is gone? But I have something else for you. In the process of um, doing this vulnerability research, we discovered there's this whole bucket of vulnerabilities called unverified. So those are vulnerabilities that researchers find. They submit them to manufacturers. Manufacturers go and try to figure out if that vulnerability is actually real. And in the process, they make a patch. And by the time they're done with that, they release it to the public. Well, this information is available to us and attackers before that verification process ever gets completed. Attackers are writing exploits and they're writing proof of concept code against unverified vulnerabilities before we ever know about it. This is a whole bucket of zero days that like, we're not considering. We're not paying attention to that right now. So even if you can patch in 24 hours, bravo to you, um, you can't do anything about these unverified vulnerabilities. This is absolutely why you guys have to have an app, a WAF, a web application firewall in place this day and age, because you just can't deal with vulnerability management these days without a WAF. So last thing on reducing your attack surface, what I'm showing you guys here is a list of top SSH brute force attack credentials. Um, everything I've highlighted in red are applications that I know you guys use in your environments. Um, you don't have to squint too hard, and if you want, take a picture, but this is all published on F5 Labs, so you guys can just go to our site and download it. Um, but look, Jenkins, MySQL, Hadoop, um, Nagios, Postgres, Ubuntu, GitHub, Oracle. If you guys are using vendor default creds in production, your systems are probably owned right now. SSH brute force attacks are like one of, it, it, it's literally the most voluminous attack that goes on on the internet on a regular basis, and they're always looking for vendor default creds. So last thing, um, we want you guys to prioritize your defenses based on where you're most likely to get attacked. Your budgets, your capex budgets, your operational expense, your people, their time, they should be focused in the areas that you are most likely to get attacked. They should be priorities for your business. You shouldn't want to have to deal with the breach. It's a pain in the ass, trust me. Um, if you're not focusing your money and your time in the areas where you're most likely to get attacked, they're not priorities, and they should be, right? Um, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. When it comes to identity attacks, access attacks, you know, the number two breach root cause, it is really, really, really important that you train your employees. Most of your employees don't know that they are the target. They don't know what goes on on the big bad internet. They need to be aware of what phishing is. System administrators, you guys in this room, you guys are actually the number one target in your organization. Nation states target you, adversaries target you. They leverage information that people put on social media to their advantage, and they make their targeted phishing attacks, spear phishing, they make them more effective. People need to know that. Um, after sysadmins, HR, accounting, and executives are the second group of people that are targeted the most. They need to be aware of this. If you guys do security awareness training and you make sure that they understand that they are a target and how to identify phishing, it's gonna go a long ways in preventing a breach. We really encourage everybody to implement a culture of curiosity. I'm stealing that from the NSA. I really like it. I think it's great. Um, if you can get somebody to think twice and ask questions and click later, you will literally prevent a breach. So uh, I threw a lot at you in 20 minutes. Um, myself and some of the other members of the labs team that are here at the conference will be at our F5 Labs booth over lunch for the next uh, two days. 
So I would love to dig deep on any of this stuff with you guys, answer any questions. Um, if you guys follow us on f5labs.com, we're also on Twitter. We publish two pieces of content a week. We do not plug F5 products and services. We are literally here as an agnostic group of people to help you. Um, we'll take research ideas. We'll give you advice. Like I said, a lot of us are ex-CISOs, so we're literally here to help. So thank you. Thank you.